Hey, bless you all. Much love, much love to everybody that's listening and tuning in tonight. Hope you're doing well. This is Elder Becker, Elder Douglas Becker, with this brother segment of Blog Talk Radio. Hope to stay find you all well. Uh, appreciate you all tuning in. Um, I'm assuming I'm coming in great. Thank you so much, sister, uh, sisters and brothers, for the, uh, the the sound check. For some reason, I can't type into my chat tonight. I don't know what re- it, it disconnected and reconnected, and it locked me out. So, um, greetings to you all. Hope you're all doing well. Hope you're all encouraged, and hope you're all seeking the most high continually, getting right before Him. Hallelujah. Um, let's see. Well, I mean, obviously the Most High is going, has, has uh, uh, put it back on Pastor to get us back into spiritual warfare because, you know, the enemy is always after. He is the enemy of our soul. He's always seeking to, to uh, remove us and stop us from um, trying to get into Yah's kingdom. You know, he's uh, a master at what he does, and we have to continue to keep exposing uh, what is Satan is doing? How them spirits work? What you know? What, if, you know the list that Pastor gave yesterday on Shabbat service. Um, I've seen that list repeated many times over the years, and it still astounds me how many that are just listed in the Word alone. And when you even dig deeper than that, the list just you know doubles and triples because you know there's such a, a host of wicked and evil things out there that want to find rest in, in your house, which is you. And so it's no wonder that Yahshua showed us that, you know, um, he was manifest that he might destroy the works of Satan and get these spirits cast out of us. So don't take it for granted, you know, study. Um, examine yourself and, and do what you have to do to get your house clean uh, because you do serve a king of kings. You do serve a, a loving and merciful Elohim that desires to have you peer before him. So take advantage of it. Hallelujah. Oh, let's see. Um, yeah, Passover. Wow, boy, it goes so fast. It gets here. It's probably the fat. Anytime we have a feast, it's just like it's a blur. It's like it's here, everybody shows up, and then you blink your eyes, and everybody's leaving already. Um, it was good to see the saints. It truly was. It was good to see a lot of new faces here. Now, I hope that you all got to meet a lot of the newer saints are here. Uh, you know, I, I invited probably more saints this year, gave them the okay to come than I ever have in all the years. And unfortunately, I think I only met about half of them. Uh, just, yeah, well, hopefully that they stay the course and that they'll be a part of Yah's um, next feast. But, uh, yeah, it was good. It was a beautiful Passover, and I thank the Most High that uh, he allowed me for my 23rd year to uh, be a part of his Passover feast. Um, I do want to thank Yahweh for his mercies. I want to thank him for uh, always um, ordering my steps, even sometimes when I don't understand which, you know, exactly what he's got, got in store for me. But I do thank him for that. I, I thank Yahshua for his blood and for forgiveness and repentance and this opportunity to serve him and uh, his saints and um, be a part of his kingdom. I truly do. It's very humbling. Um, Tonight we're going to talk about, I didn't get a chance to get up a title, which is typical, but tonight we're going to be talking about assumptions and assertions. And um, I really didn't have anything going into blog talk, and it's kind of just laid on my spirit here about fifth day, so I put this together on pretty short notice. I typically like to have a little bit longer time um, to, you know, put things together, but Yah does all things on time. So um, that's what we'll be talking tonight is is about assumptions and assertions. Um, so I hope you enjoy this. And the one thing that I see about assumptions, it's it's you know, it's very close to accusation. An assumption is very close to an accusation, though it, it differs slightly, but it's in the, in the same type of demon grouping. So assumption and assertions are demonic spirits, and a lot of us deal with them. I, hell, I, you know, I'm transparent. I still get caught up in assumptions they're assuming and then assert that assumption and um, never really think to repent for it. 
I mean, who really does? But we're going to talk about that more. So again, tonight it's, this, this study is called Assumptions and Assertions. And with that, we'll get started. Hey, thank you, bro, Josh, for uh, always, um, you know, being there for all the blog talks, for, you know, showing the saints the scriptures and the definitions. Um, do greatly appreciate it. And with that, we're going to get started. All right, an assumption. This is what an assumption is. An assumption is something that you accept as true or fact without question or proof. Again, an assumption is something that you accept as true or fact without question or proof. Some synonyms of, synonyms of, of assumptions would be suppositions, presuppositions, presumptions, uh, premises, Beliefs, expectations, conjecture, speculation, uh, to surmise something, to guess, um, conclusion as in jumping to conclusions, and inference, inference, uh, suspicion, a notion, and impression. So all these have to do with, with assumptions. Okay, Josh got the Oxford Dictionary up there. Yeah, without proof. That's a slightly different... Um, definition, but it's very close to the one I got. I forgot where I got mine exactly. And an assertion is a statement that you strongly believe is true. And some synonyms for assertions are a declaration, a contention, a statement, a claim, a submission, postulation, a vehement opinion, proclamation, profession, swearing, insistence. So when you put the two together, when you see how one works after the other, again, because first the assumption comes, or that spirit of assumption comes into you and gets you to assume something, and then you act on that assumption and you speak it. So basically what we have is a declaration or a statement one strongly believes is truth or fact based on an individual acceptance of something being true, and that without question, proof, or investigation. Uh, what we have working is first the assumption and then the assertion of that assumption, if that's making sense. I hope everybody's following me. I'm going to try to make this as clear as possible. But that's what we got. Typically, the assumption, well, again, it's really close to an accusation, but it, it's assuming something and it's jumping in right into it without actually um, examining it and and believing in your own self that it's true or fact without question or proof and then actually speaking that or asserting that to be something that you strongly believe is true. And, and the whole time, the assumption what you're asserting is completely false and based on um, uh, could, based on a lie, basically what it is. All right, some things, bullet points about assumptions and assertions. We have a propensity to make assumptions based on appearance, based on things said, things seen, things heard, and incomplete statements. Hey, bless you, Brother Willie. Good to see you, my brother. When we make assumptions, we are actually revealing more of what's in our hearts than what may be the case with those to whom the assumption is held. So we're speaking out of something, something that we have uh, evil towards our brother. It could be something we have evil towards our sister. And right away we assume that there's a failure on their part when in fact it's us and something in our own heart towards them. Assumptions and assertions can open the door to a whole host of other demonic spirits such as accusations, self-righteousness, gossip, slander, bitterness, pride, anger, and a whole lot of other demonic spirits. So once that door opens, it invites the, the possibility and probability of all these other spirits coming right along with assumption and assertion. When we make assumptions and assert them as truth, we place ourselves in the position of a judge, jury, and finally the past sentence. Assumptions are often based on false perceptions, false pretenses. Assumptions and assertions often disguise themselves as people claiming it's discernment. When we hear, quote, bad things, and we witness what we believe are failures on others' parts, we tend to jump immediately to an assumption and assert the belief that's already in our hearts 
without first investigating what truly were the facts. And I can submit so many stories that over my 20-some years that I have witnessed this to be fact. You know, the assumption turns into, you know, so-and-so doing this, and then there's the assertion that he was, his intent or her intent was this, and then without actually investigating or asking questions, um, just assuming right away somebody's guilty as charged based on your assumption, and then that's what you charge him with. You place yourself in a position of a judge and pass sentence that they're guilty. And then if he had gone a little bit farther, I mean, I've had situations where I've been informed about a certain particular thing going here on the land, and, you know, this was said, this was said, and it gets back to me, and then I'll sit down and talk to everybody and get the story, what you need to do. And I find out that the one that actually um, asserted the assumption, his assumption, or the accusation, failed completely to do any investigation, just saw something, and assumed that, according to their belief, because they may have an offense towards the brother or whatever, um, they assumed right away that this brother was intently and purposely doing something based on their uh, this own person's understanding of what he was, the, the perception he had in his own eyes, and it was far from the truth. And how often do people actually go back and uh, really think about this and repent for things like that? I mean, really, I'm, anytime I get a, 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 a something like this, I always put myself right center and focal because God isn't giving it to me to give to everybody else. He needs me to examine myself first. And, boy, I can see where I failed at this miserably, and I thank him that I have uh, discovered more that I can actually repent of and turn from and be aware of. All right, we're going to start in Second Samuel chapter 16, and we're going to start at verse 5. And we're going to go all the way to verse 13. So it's 2 Samuel 16, 5 through 13. Again, talking about assumptions and assertions. And every thing, account that I read here, remember that an assumption is something you accept as true without question or proof. An assertion is a statement that you strongly believe is true, and you can... Um, tie these directly to each one of these accounts that we're going to investigate tonight. Yeah, exactly, Brother Willie, jumping the gun. All right, um, 2 Samuel 16 has to do with the situation, a little context, background, when Absalom was raising himself up to be uh, a king in, in, against his own father. And he was, um, he was garnering the favor of the people around him. And David seeing that he didn't want Jerusalem to come under war by, you know, within its own um, boundaries, uh, its own limits of the city, and especially by his own son, he chose rather to take his house and the faithful that were with him and leave the city rather than have the city besieged by war, right, right there in the midst. So um, that's the context around it. So then we're going to see this man named Shimei, who was of the house of Saul, come in and level a whole bunch of assumptions, and then assert those assumptions based on his own beliefs. Okay, so starting at verse 5, And when the, and when King David came to Baharim, behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gerera, and he came forth, and he cursed still as he came. So they're riding out of the city, and here comes this man named Shimei, and he's cursing, and we're going to find out he was just having an absolute fit. And he cast stones at David and all the servants of Yah, or all the servants of King David, and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. So he was surrounded by a company of, of you know, very important people. He's right in the midst of them, and he had, he had David's entourage there. You know, he had the captain of hosts, uh, uh, um, uh, Abishai uh, was there, I believe Joab was there, and a few others, and because they were protecting the king. But this man is coming up, he's cursing at David, and he's he's casting stones at him. Man, you talk about somebody that believes that they're justified in their own spirit to actually to go this length, because this is against the king, right? And thus said Shimei when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man, thou man of Belial. So this man is laying out all kinds of stuff out there. He's calling David everything under the sun because he believes that he's absolutely right based on his own 
assumption, his own perception, his own suspicions, his own contentions. Verse 8, Yahweh hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned. And Yahweh hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom thy son, and behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. Again, the picture we have here is this man, he is justified. He became judge, jury, and he's passing sentence all one time because he's greatly under the flu and the, inspirit, the influence of the spirits of assumption, assertion, and ultimately accusation. And so he believes um, what he is speaking is actually the truth based on his own mind by past experiences and probably things that have been brewing. Who knows how long he's, he's held um, uh, bitterness and anger towards uh, King David because he's blaming David for the things that um, happened to Saul. So he's got all this stuff going on in him, and he's out here shouting all these profanities, and he's basically just wishing death on David, casting the stones as a form of injury, words as a form of injury, right? Again, verse 8, this verse reflects the assumptions of the heart of Shimei and the assertions which were made towards David. Shimei assumed that it was that all that was happening to David was because of the belief that David somehow had something to do with Saul losing his kingdom. Okay, verse 9. Then said Abishai, the son of Zariah, unto the king, Why should this dead dog curse my master, the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. And that's what, once you defend um, those that have the rule of authority over you, those that have been set up over you, I mean, that's what Abishai was. He was part of the, the captain of hosts, like Joab, his brother, and Azazel, his other brother, right? And they were very important in the ranking in the military, and they were there to protect Dave, and, and Abishai's like, man, what are we letting this this dead dog pull this crap off right in front of the king, right? What is this man doing? Let, let me go just go lop his head off, because obviously the infraction, what he's doing to you, is he's worthy of death. I mean, you ask yourself, isn't how, if we saw somebody doing this in our leadership here in this ministry, that would be... Our response, like, man, let's just take this man out. What the hell is going on? That that would just be a righteous response. I mean, you see it happen to one of our pastors or one of our elders or, you know, anybody, even a, even a fellow brother or sister, that, that would be our response is to go over and cut off that occasion that evil is finding against them, right? I mean, that, that would just be defending our brothers and sisters. Um, verse 10. And the king said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zariah? So David's like, Man, why are you getting in the mix of this, right? And that probably just floored Zariah. It's like, Man, wait a minute. Or, uh, I'm sorry, about Abishai. Like, like Abish, Abishai. And he's like, What in the world? What have, I, what have I to do with you, sons of Zariah? So let him curse. Because Yahweh has said unto him, Curse David. Who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? Now again, who could, could you imagine for a minute that a leader in Israel would respond with words such as the ones David just said? Who would have been able to guess about this kind of speech coming from leadership? I mean, that probably just like, whoa, rocked all the people, man. That man up here up to some type of thing. You know, this reminds me very much of a demonstration of this when we had a piece of crap here. Uh, long story, I'll make it really short, but Pastor allowed this, this thing, anyway, to speak before the congregation this happened when we were in the old tabernacle, the Chow Hall now. And this man was putting some stuff out there, but Pastor just went and sat down in the first row and let this man speak. And our, all the brothers were like, man, let's get this man off there. I mean, we're all just waiting to jump on him. And we saw the same composure with our shepherd that day. He just sat there and listened to it. I'm sure he had everything inside him wanting to get up and, and rip this man a new rear end, but it all played out. But it was a perfect demonstration of what we're seeing here. Um, and let me tell you something. It's not because what's going on here, you know, it says that you, so let him curse David. Say, because Yahweh has said unto him, curse David. Now, you have to understand a little bit more in depth what is actually going on here. It shouldn't be taken as Yahweh inspiring Shemai to curse David and take such actions against him, but that Yahweh is simply allowing these things to play out and to leave things be for the present. And David must have known the command in Exodus twenty two twenty eight, where it is written, Thou shalt not revile 
the gods or the curse to rule in my people. He obviously had to know that, so um, he just let us out knowing that Yah has this happening for a purpose and intention. That's David's discernment. So again, following the same thing, this is first the assumption on Shimei's part, and the assertion are actually speaking of that assumption or accusation. Verse 11, And David said unto Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my son, which came forth out of my bowels, seeketh my life. And how much more now may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone and let him curse, for Yahweh hath bidden him. It may be that Yahweh will look on my affliction, excuse me, and that the Most High will requite me good for his cursing this day. And we find out that Shimei, when you when you find out that later on when Solomon became king, um, he he actually allowed Shimei to, to live, and he said if you ever leave outside the city limits at all for the rest of your days, you would be put to death. And and Shimei did, and he got his due reward. He got killed. And verse 13, And as David and his men went by the way, Shimei went along the hillside over against him, and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and cast dust. So we have that first example here of a man, this man having some reservation already in his heart, having some uh, idea of what he believed to be the truth. And when these things came to play, he saw the events unfolding. He assumed that David was automatically guilty. He didn't. He didn't bother to investigate or ask questions, even though it may not have been his place. But again, that spirit of assumption was in him, was something already in his heart towards David. And um, when it became full-blown, he took that assumption and he asserted it in the form of speech and physical action by casting rocks and casting dust up in the air and that kind of thing. You saw the physical manifestation of them spirits besides anger, pride, and everything else that came with it. So that's just one example there. All right, now we're going to go to Acts chapter 2. And, and again, there's so many uh, things written in, 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 in the Bible that you can place this to. It, I mean, I could have you know used 100 examples, but to keep it short, you all understand the point. All right, Acts chapter 2, verses 1. Acts chapter 2, verses 1, and through, let's see... My papers turn here, 1 through 15, Acts chapter 2, 1 through 15, verses 1 through 15. And we all know the story, at least we should know. This should be something that's been, you know, just fully registered in my memory, in our memories, our minds, because this is when, on the day of Pentecost, when they were all gathered in the upper room, when the, when the Ruach was first poured out. So when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. So we know this was on the first day of the week, after the seventh Sabbath had elapsed. And um, they were all gathered there as they were commanded to do it, to wait on the promise of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to be seeing this here in, what, 40 days or whatever, 40 whatever it is now. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. So we have all this stuff going on, these people with all these expectations that were faithful enough to stir. They're seeing this, this supernatural stuff starting to take place, right? And things that they've never experienced before. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. Of course, all those that are being gathered in the upper room, which... You look, it seems to be like a pretty decent amount. What was it, 120 gathered in there? Pretty good sized room. And they were all filled with the Ruach HaKadosh and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Yehudims, those of Judah, devout men out of every nation under heaven. So we not only have those that were actually in Jerusalem that were of Judah, but we had men, devout men out of every, every, uh, every nation under heaven, all gathered there in the upper room, all watching these things unfold, seeing this mighty manifestation, this mighty move of Yahweh. And so you can imagine what's going on in the mind, right? What in the world is going on here? Even though they were told because they had never seen this manifestation before. 
Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Again, the, the miracle is in the hearing, not so much in the speaking, but in the hearing. The word confounded here, he has used in verse 6, means uh, it's the Greek 4797. This is out of the Thayer definition for anybody that wants to know. It's to pour together, commingle. It's to disturb the mind of one, to stir up, to tumult or outbreak, to confound or bewilder. So basically, and they were confounded, their minds were disturbed by what they saw, right? Because it sounds like more people came into this thing going, because they they heard all the commotion, right? And who knows, uh, you know, the uh, who knows what people were saying or yelling or what the communication was, but all of a sudden you have more people even coming and witnessing this incredible event. But they were completely confounded, and they were disturbed in their mind. <clears throat> Verse 7. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? Um, you know, there is something in a man which demands that we have understanding of everything that befalls himself or herself in life in order for us to be at peace. We will rationalize the mess out of everything until we found, till we're found to be satisfied and content with things that have played out. But these devout men learned, leaned to their own understanding, and all the multitude that came together, they leaned to their own understanding rather than trust that this is something from the hand of Yahweh. And we'll jump back, Carl, if I can use that, right? And they're questioning, right? So now they got all this stuff going inside, and, the, and these assumptions are starting to build. In fact, they're already there, and they're start, starting to assert or the rationalization that's already in their mind, and they start speaking that. Again, first the assumption, and then the assertion. How we hear every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born. I mean, how is this possible? Because they can't explain it in any of the things. So right away, um, you know, there's this uh, uh, own personal conclusion or jumping to conclusion. Uh, or the suspicion that this isn't something other than what it, you know, because we don't understand it automatically, it, it can't, it doesn't meet our acceptance level. Again, how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? And he goes on and makes the list Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt. And in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and the strangers of Rome, Yahudims and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of Yah. And they were all amazed and were in doubt. Again, because they couldn't explain it. Now here comes doubt just busting right through the door. This can't be because we can't explain it. We can't rationalize it. We, we can't arrive any of our own personal conclusions. Right? We're just... So we're trying to postulate, form an assumption, so we're speaking, we're asserting our assumption here. Because we're going to speak it out of our what we believe to be the truth, not knowing the facts, or having any proof of what's actually going on. It's just something that entered in the eyes and the ears. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? What, what, in the, what in the world is going on? What, what's all this mean? Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. Again, they were assuming that they were drunk, that there was something else going on. Okay, here we have another clear case of the workings of assumption and then assertions. These devout men are those of all the other nations, accepted within them own selves their own understanding and interpretation of the events they witnessed as their truth, rather than question to find out the real reasons behind what they saw and heard, or that they sought out proof to satisfy their assumptions, which they didn't do. They just jumped into full-blown meltdown mode, and they started pointing the finger. In verse 14, you can see how easy this stuff happens, right? I mean, it does. If you don't catch yourself, it's just right there. We're just asserting something instantly, not even catching the assumption in our mind. It's usually, we speak it so fast that there's no um, conscience, uh, conscience, uh, um, looking into ourselves as we speak. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice, you know, because he had to shout over all these people, 
questioning and mocking and doing everything else. You can imagine all these people in here and all the people that came running in there, everybody talking and going on and people speaking in tongues, and I can only imagine what that scene looked like. He lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known on you and hearken my words. So here comes Peter. He's going to set the record straight. He's going to dismiss all these false notions and all these assumptions, right? Because, again, they assumed that they were drunk or, you know, somehow out of order. And Peter addresses it, and he said in verse 15, And these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. And, and the word suppose is the Greek 5274. I won't even pronounce it. Um, but uh, cut right to the definition, mentally to assume or presume. So these are not drunken as you presume or you assume or your assumption, seeing this but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken of by the prophet. Here comes the proof, right? Peter's going to pour out the proof. He's, he, he, they wouldn't bother. They didn't bother to wait and question afterwards what had happened. They 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 already determined now. But Peter's going to show them. Here's the proof. It's already been written of. If you had known this, you'd know what was going on. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith Yahweh, I pour out my out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Boy, that's the truth. I think I dream every single night. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So again, we can see how the spirit of assumption entered in by what was being seen and heard without investigating or having understanding anything of the facts that were going on or looking further into the matter, and then coming up a conclusion or an assertion such as, well, this got to be an act of being drunk in the morning already, you know, taken to the wine. That's what all this babbling's got to be about. So, again, you know, just waiting, and actually when, some, when an event comes up like this in front of you, and it will present itself almost daily, it's like, okay, so I may not understand it, um, and... You know, if it's necessary for me to know more, I'm going to ask questions and I'm going to investigate. So I get a clarity about what this is because I don't want to accuse anybody. I don't want to assume anything. I sure don't want to assert anything or speak anything foolishly. Okay, Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39. And we're going to go verses 5 through 19. Genesis 39. Again, 5 through 19, and this is the story of Joseph and being in Potiphar's house. Alrighty. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house, meaning Potiphar made uh, Joseph the overseer, and we're going to find out why, and over all that he had, and that Yahweh blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of Yahweh was upon all that he had in his house and all the fields. So, obviously, by Joseph's presence there and by the elevation in his um, authority, even as somebody of another nation, you can see that Potiphar had a lot of trust and a lot of um, confidence in Joseph. And because he did, and Joseph being in the house... Potiphar's house was blessed. He, he couldn't deny it. He could see it, right? I mean, he knew Joseph's track record. He knew the man that was amongst them in his house. I mean, would you leave a man to um, take care of your house and run your house if you didn't trust him, if you didn't have some level of, um, you know, a check inside that said this man is actually trustworthy, he's honest, he's, and we can see that the Most High is with him? No, you wouldn't. But this kind of man you could. Verse six, and he had left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he not and he knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and very well favored, not only by Potiphar but by also the entire house. Again, this was the report of Joseph among those who he lived. That's very important. Joseph had a continual track record, a continual pattern, right? A presentation daily amongst these people, just like we do, a lot of us do, with each other, brothers and sisters, especially if you're in a community. You know those that labor among you. And you know that, um, especially those that 
their, their heart is always right. Their intent is good. They can be trusted. Um, they're giving many duties. Um, you know, they uh, they always do their best to make sure everything is covered and performed to the best of their abilities, right? And we have the same situation here. We have this type of model there. I mean, faithful. Let me just use the word faithful in all their house, right? And verse 7, And it came to pass after these things that the master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. So we got this wicked woman. We got our first glimpse of Satan trying to destroy Joseph, working through the lust of another to destroy the credibility of the one who has shown himself faithful, dependable, and trusting. And don't think for a second that Satan won't use your brother or sister to do the same thing to you. Those that are submitted to his will, right? For whatever gain or whatever purpose to try to take him. Because I'll tell you what, um, I have seen many times where, in fact, I remember stories out of the old Overcomer ministry where there was other brothers that were so offended by somebody's righteous zeal and desire that um, they get angry. I mean, we see that with our brother Trey here. There's actually brothers that are upset with him and mad at him because Trey has such a liberty in Yahshua. And we have Satan entering these brothers trying to commit things into his ears, trying to get him to back down. And I've spoken to Trey. He's come to me. off. said, brother, you just put it on, brother. You do every, You get filled up every time. You make these spirits to shake and shudder and just get them so pissed off that they, they just have to walk out, right? Don't give them no place. Don't give them no court, right? Because that's what exactly what the Satan's going to do. He's going to send somebody in that's... Um, can be easily influenced, whose mind isn't on guard, and use that to try to destroy another, to try to destroy those that are faithful, dependable, trusting, and who are credible. But, back to verse 8, But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master won't not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath in my hand. And what if not, I had to go look this up, because it's like, man, that these crazy, sometimes crazy English words, but old English. But what if not is mean that one which had the rule of authority over Joseph and trusted Joseph with his entire house because he knew Joseph to be righteous, honest, and upright man. Meaning that, yeah, that's what it meant that um, the, the, the master of the house completely trusted Joseph and everything in all of his house. He doesn't have to go behind and investigate Joseph or watch over his shoulder and he just let Joseph run the business, so to speak. That makes sense. Again, we're on, we're watching um, an assumption play out, an accusation, and an assertion. And we're going to watch the uh, somebody become a judge, jury, and pass sentence, all because um, um, this spirit entered into this man. Right? We're going to see it, and this happens. Uh, and again, the whole the beauty of the story is is that it. There's a few things is that Joseph, again, was faithful. Well, and why would you even think about uh, is the master of the house? He wouldn't even stop for a second and say, wait a minute. But what the real thing that's troubling, he totally trusted his wife and her words and totally blew off all the, all the things he had seen Joseph prior to that. All that totally went out the window, and he fully believed his wicked wife's report, as we'll get to there, right? Because she didn't like what she sees, she wanted something that she couldn't. She had a, uh, uh, she perceived something, or whatever the case may be. Okay, there's a whole lot of different things. Verse nine: There is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath I kept back. So Joseph's reasserting his position. This is I've been placed in here. This is my credentials, right? I don't know how you can miss that. And I'm I'm not I I've got this position because of the trust I had with those of the rule of authority over me. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against Yah? I mean, how could Joseph do this great sin and wicked deed against Yah, seeing that Yahweh has blessed him and highly favored him? He knew he couldn't, right? He never would, because he knew Yah was with him. And of course, this was a test for him, too. And whatever the devil means for evil, Yah means for good. And it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day, just wearing him. She's trying to break this man, right? And what can he do? I mean, who can he go to? Who can he talk to? All he can do is stay in righteous position, right? And she's just trying to wear him out. 
day by day that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there went within. So there was the first mistake. I mean, he, he was so probably naturally maybe he didn't think about it, but left alone in the house, and it's like, oh, maybe he didn't know she was in there right away. But I mean, <laughs> if you ever find yourself in that situation, you got a woman that's, um, you know, approaching like uh, unhealthy, especially a married woman. It's like, man, I ain't going in this house. I figured you would, somebody in this ministry better speak up long before that ever gets there. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. Man, ain't no way. Joseph is wanting no part of this, right? And it came to pass, and when she saw that he had fled, left his garment in her hand and was fled for, though now she in trouble. Now what's going to happen, right? And she called unto the men of the house, and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in a Hebrew unto... Uh, now she's totally going to discredit this man, and totally tried to destroy this faithful man, this man that the master placed second under him, right? And try to get support for her side. How often do we see that when we're caught red-handed with something, and we try to go garner support from those around us, try to get a coalition, so it doesn't look so bad. So if we get more than one voice or two or three witness, man, it's got to be established, man. Ah, uh, ain't going to happen. And then she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in Hebrew unto mock us. He came in unto lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. Okay, now this, again, this wicked, wicked woman is going to those that are under her in her house, and she's trying to gain, garner all the support and those to take her side. Are you kidding me, this stupid computer? I'm trying to do a restart in the middle of a broadcast. And it came to pass when he heard that I had lifted up my voice, so now she's going to paint a story, right? That he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. And she laid up his garment by her unto his master, until the master came home, her Lord came home. And she spake according to to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us came in unto me to mock me. And it came to pass that I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled out. And it came to pass when his master, her master, heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did his servants to me that his wrath was kindled. Again, her master automatically accepted her words as true without question or proof, even knowing the manner of man Joseph what his background uh, and all that Joseph was in, because of who Joseph was, it blessed the house. Joseph then became vile and despised in the eyes of the halls because it being because it being not so much the wickedness of his wife, but more so because the master refused to question and investigate the matter. So the automatically, the master of the house assumed or allowed the spirit of assumption to get in his mind to paint a picture by his wife's wicked words. And he formulated this in his, in his own mind, his own assumption that what she's saying has to be the absolute truth. He didn't bother to go talk to Joseph. He didn't bother to go investigate to see what was actually going on. He just went off, right? And he became judge, jury, and passed sentence. All because of an assumption and, and he asserting him and her assertion in his ears. Um, again, knowing Joseph's track record. Now you play this out in real time, right? And you apply this to yourself. Who do you know, that, uh, your brothers and sisters? Even if, if they're not the most favorable uh, in the ministry, still, this, this should always prevent you um, from never to assume or assume anything and then speak out of that assumption about anybody when things go wrong and it looks like they're implicated. Because if you don't know what's going on, you ain't got no business saying nothing or speaking to anybody else. I mean, you, you can enter into a whole lot of sin and transgression when you open your mouth, you speak to people that are faithful and give your own opinion about what stuff is going on, and that's nothing more about your own assumption about uh, because you have a certain belief about somebody or some sister, some brother, some leader, whatever the case may be. But you can apply this across the board, right? But here again, we have a wife because this is, this is you know, her master's wife, and she would never 
ever, you know, tell him wrong. She's a reliable source, right? But we have a clear example here that she was able to um, uh, just speak the words that she did, and her husband pulled this in full force, and now this innocent man who had been faithful all the days, never caused one ounce of trouble, always did his best and everything, was accused. All right, anyway. Uh, and isn't a wife considered a trusted or reliable source, one whose words a husband would automatically accept as true and never think to look into things before assuming her position and then leveling fault against others? Why is this then when we find ourselves taking sides of those we have greater relationships with without doing that which is right and not assuming that those we are close to are automatically right in their assertions, especially when it is against those who have a history of being faithful and in good standing. And that does happen. That actually does happen. I've been guilty of it. I'll admit it right here in front of everybody. I have been guilty of this. And I thank the God that he has showed me where I have failed miserably. Already placing the blame and already coming into an assumption and asserting the, that thing to you know those that I believe are you know spiritually entitled to hear what I got to say. And find out later I was totally wrong and like, damn, all right, man, okay, and you think about it, well, I'll just pass it off as discernment, when in the fact, I just got caught ran and going to be used as Satan. All right, verse 20, and Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prison was bound, and he was there in prison. Again, we put each other in prison when we decide that our assumptions about such and such person are valid, and they are deserving of a wrath as we have placed ourselves as judges over them. We do the same thing. Again, we can't apply. We, yeah, we, we read what happened to Joseph, and you know what we had and it happened in the upper room, and what we had happen um, in Second Samuel with, with Shimei. But we need to to always put this in our own minds. This is something that we've been guilty of, right? All right, First Samuel sixteen, verse seven. First Samuel sixteen, verse seven. But Yahweh said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For Yahweh seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance by using the senses. That's how man receives his information. But Yahweh looketh on the heart. And the reason I only had this one verse in there, I didn't feel like going into all things, but this is when Samuel was instructed by the Most High to seek out David, and his appearance was small and ruddy, right? But God was saying, that's you see as a man see, you probably would have never picked David, but I know what's going on here, right? I look on the heart, and what I'm trying to say is that we have to understand like Yah does. Um, that's what we have to do, because oftentimes our perception of things, we, we take in through the, our hearing, through our eyes, through people's actions, or whatever the, the, the situation may be, and um, totally disregarding that, um, how how would Yah look at it? How would he see it? Well, and that would slow you down automatically. I mean, it's like, okay, wait a minute. Let me ask myself this, right? Before I just jump ship here and and decide that I'm going to become judge, jury, and and pass sentence. How what what is Yah doing here? What 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 is to be seen in here? Even if I don't have privy to the, the facts or to investigate, we still have to sit back and just say, okay, wait a minute. We'll see how this plays out, right? Sirach chapter 11, verse 7, and this is a scripture that I try to hold near to me all the time. Sometimes um, I don't apply it like I should, but I, I've learned more and more, especially being in the role of an elder, that I have to apply this because, um, again, not doing so has uh, uh, not doing so has left me guilty of um, misjudging many times prior to this. But Sirach chapter 11, verse 7, or Ecclesiasticus chapter 11, verse 7. Blame not before thou hast examined the truth. Understand first, and then rebuke if it's necessary. Again, blame not before thou hast examined the truth. If you remember this principle, in everything that you do, that will certainly put the brakes on assumption and assertion. 
and accusation and everything else, all the other spirit that come with it. If you just say, well, i got to figure out what's going on here, what's the whole story here, i got to look behind the scenes. Again, blame not before thou hast examined the truth. Understand first. Get all the information you possibly can, all of it, so you can come to a wise conclusion, and then rebuke if it's necessary. All right, to blame means to say or think that someone or something did something wrong or is responsible for something bad happening. So don't think that someone is or something has someone or something did something wrong or is responsible for something bad happening until you have examined the truth. And then when you find out that they have, then you go ahead and deal with it properly, if that makes sense. And another thing that just popped in my head that I wrote a note earlier is Humility, a spirit of humility will definitely keep accusation at bay, assumption, um, assertion, and all the synonyms that are read earlier. You know, suspicion, um, jumping to conclusions, surmising, speculation, all those things will be kept at bay just by staying, keeping a spirit of humility. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 13. Proverbs 18, verse 13. He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. Basically, he that has come to their own assumptions and acceptance of something as truth before and without questioning or seeking the facts and then asserting those assumptions as truth, this is folly and shame. This is where you're going to find out that uh, they're going to make a total fool of themselves because they were wrong. But men's pride, that's another spirit that deals with this when they found out they're wrong, is they won't admit they're wrong. They believe that, well, you know, it's just something that I had to do and I, my intent was right. So, well, you can say that all day long, but your approach is wrong and you are used of Satan. That's just what it comes down to. You still have some repentance to do. Um, Yeah, again, but where is the repentance when such things happen? When we assume things to be such and such and find out we were completely wrong about what really happened. Whoever thinks to repent for this, we tend to sweep things under the proverbial rug as though it was no big thing that our actions were merited and should be accepted, not considering the shame and blame erroneously placed on others because of our lack of due diligence. Zechariah chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. Zechariah 8, 16 and 17. These are the things that you shall do. Do these things. This is admonishment. Speak ye every man truth to his neighbor. Execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates. And let none of you imagine evil in your hearts. That's how a lot of these assumptions begin, these accusations and all these other um, things that we're talking about tonight. Let none of you imagine evil in your hearts, because when you do, you already they already don't stand a chance. I mean, they're already guilty if you're already imagining evil. Your thoughts, because it's gener an evil thought is generated from the heart, or that evil... Uh, that's already there towards a brother or sister, that anger, that offense, whatever, is already in the heart, so whatever you speak is more than likely going to be negative against them. And they're, they're never going to meet your level of satisfaction according to your proverbial book. Again, let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor, and love no false oath, for all these things are things that I hate, saith Yahweh. Again, we tend to assume the worst in someone when things, because of appearance sake, point to that person as being guilty. It is the old nature in man that jumps to the negative impressions, as our pre-conversion self was to find the wrong in things in order to make us feel as though we have it all together and are always right. This is actually just pride. That's what it is, good old-fashioned pride. Or not good, but old-fashioned pride. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 8. Proverbs 25, verse 8. Go not forth hastily to strive. I mean, don't be jumping the gun. Lest thou know not what to do in the end thereof when thy neighbor hath put thee to shame. Why? Don't get out of pocket. Don't jump to conclusions and assumptions and cause an uproar about things that have happened concerning 
your brother or sister because you assume things are the way they are based on your perception and not giving due diligence to know the whole matter. Not questioning what happened, not getting the proof and the facts of what really happened. And your neighbor will put you to shame because that's the way that you approached him. The shame will come back on you. Sirach 1820, we're going to finish on this. Before judgment, examine thyself. I mean, that would stop, even if the assumption comes in there, like Pastor would said many times, and has been saying a lot lady, and he said a lot yesterday in Shabbat service, that we don't have to speak everything that comes into our mind. We should have a whole lot more filter on what's going on. We should be more aware of our thoughts that enter in. Now, we understand, and we do know that we do slip at times. Even in Sirach talks about that. And, it, and we do slip in speech, but uh, that's common to man. But that should tell us next time that we just learn that to be learned to be more observant about what we're about to say. Again, before judgment, examine thyself, and in the day of visitation thou shalt find mercy. Because you spoke, or you didn't speak. Remember, everything, when, when you assert some something, it's a matter of, you know, whatever you speak is a matter of uh, life or death. Because it does come from the heart, which comes out of your mouth. Anyway, that's the conclusion of tonight's study. Again, the title was Assumption and Assertions. I do truly hope that there was some edification there. And it was it was uh, something to be able to help us going forward. Um, I truly do to get more clean before the Most High. And uh, you just out of personal experience, it's so easy to assume everything, especially you know because it's just the part of the nature of the old man. It truly is. You know, we, we've got the broad spectrum on everything that happens, and we, we we can we are all our conclusions are right. So you know, from here on out, I just encourage you when when you have cause where you believe you need to assert something or speak something, you know, make sure you have the facts first. And if you don't ever, if you're not allowed to have the facts, you can't get access to them, then just keep your mouth shut. It's just that simple. I mean, you may have an assumption still there, but you give it life when you speak, if that if that makes sense. So, hey, anyway, um, that's it for tonight. I appreciate you all joining in, tuning in tonight. Um, I pray that you all continually even more so as as the evil of these days gets worse and wax worse and worse um, don't let the love of yourself wax cold against your brother and sister because it is written that it will happen um, and always uh, pray for the strength and discernment for leadership always do that um, because they need it because you know they're the ones that have been ordained to speak unto you as the oracles of Yah, as Paul wrote about. These are the gifts that have been given to us to help you to get to the kingdom. So, yeah, pray for their good. Pray for their, their their strength. Pray that Satan don't deceive them any way, shape, or form, that they can see the deceptions that Satan may be trying to, you know, uh, put over their eyes. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. And again, pray for one another that we may be healed, may be made whole, that we may find a way of escape. Anyway, y'all have a blessed week. Um, have a, a strong week in the Most High. Keep your eyes on the King. Um, and fight hard against Satan because he's fighting hard against you. All right, with that, my brothers and sisters, much shalom to you all. Shalom, shalom. Uh-oh, look at him looking.